All right, welcome to the CESS meeting. This is March 2nd, and today's agenda is to discuss um, Babel and compatibility with hardened JavaScript. And we have Nicolo and Michael, Nicolo being the expert on Babel and Michael being expert on our use of Babel Atagoric for our emulation of hardened JavaScript. And we use in the, in the CESS shim, we use Babel to do an ESM to program transform in order to build out a compartment as a third-party module loader. Um, and, uh, and because of that, we need Babel to run in a hardened JavaScript environment. And at the moment, what we're doing to make that possible is for one, we're using Babel standalone. And I don't remember the reason why we're doing that, but Michael can fill us in. Um, uh, and, uh, and we have, and because Babel standalone entrains a great number of shims that um, fiddle around with shared intrinsics, uh, most notably and obviously the uh, buffer shim, um, we have to initialize Babel standalone at the application layer before we lock down. Um, otherwise, it can't initialize because it finds frozen uh, because of the um, property override mistake. Now, so that has an obvious fix. We go into the buffer shim and get a change committed upstream that changes uh, various assignments uh, into defined property calls. Um, and Michael did some work over this weekend that has greatly improved our compatibility with Babel by doing a custom build of Babel standalone in a fork. Um, but running a fork long-term isn't really tenable from a maintenance perspective. So we'd very much like to figure out what we can do uh, in order to get some of these things upstream and, what, and to what extent we, we can get Babel to be tested going forward in order to ensure that it remains compatible um, and, and whether our goals are aligned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, who wants to go first, Michael or Nicolo? Because that is everything I know. Okay, so uh, first of all, we are happy to have this discussion. We we kind of expected importing Babel to be completely like a, a completely pure operation. So we didn't expect it to modify any existing thing. So we are we are happy to update Babel to to actually work in a CS environments. So are you specifically, um, we're, we're basically doing transforms from the module system into uh, rewritable string or evaluable strings. And uh, we don't actually use any of Babel's transforms aside from the one that we've written. So um, I just wanted to ask, first of all, is Babel standalone the right way to go to not have as many dependencies on the outside environment? Um. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's probably the easiest way. However, it pulls in every single transform that we have. Uh, right. I think it's like a two megabytes file and you are not using most of that. Yeah, it's about three, which is why we can't okay. run it under <laughs> excess. <laughs> okay. Excess is too slow to load all of Babel into, uh, into memory and run it. So the possible solutions are either to uh, directly use Babel core, uh, because Babel standalone is basically a bundle of Babel core plus all the plugins. Uh, however, you might have to check in our build process how exactly to build Babel core, because there are some uh, like variables that might need to be overwritten over in order for it to work in the browser. Uh, we have some files, like for some files, we have the browser and the node version. So you have to make sure that it's everything is bundled correctly. The alternative is to not use Babel core, but to use Babel parser, Babel traverse, and Babel generator, which are the three main steps uh, that Babel core runs internally. Uh, so you first parse the code, then you apply Babel traverse to transform it with your custom transformation that you have. And then you can use Babel Generator to print it back to code. And this might be the easiest option. Uh, but you, you cannot use like normal Babel with that. Yeah, um, that's 
probably the direction we should go in. Um, I think the only reason I wasn't able to use Babel Core directly was uh, um, it tries to reference some file system APIs, for example. Yes, um, and that's why we have some separate files for browsers and for not. Uh, there is like the browser file in package.json that should tell the bundler which file to use. Yeah, the, the irony is that uh, we would need to use the browser variant on Node. <laughs> yeah, so what I did was was probably not the best way forward, but um, I actually went through the config for Babel standalone and turned off all the transforms and then uh, disabled Core.js and um, then just made some changes to the buffer shim. And then it was then it was okay, but uh, I I know that uh, in another part of our code we are just using uh, Babel traverse and parse and generate. And yeah, that's probably the best way forward. I'm not sure um, why we ended up doing the standalone step. I, I think it was because we we yeah I, I don't even know why. But, yeah, we we could. I have looked into this into the in the past, uh, trying to just use the the three components um, based off. Michael, ultimately, you built both of these: the the version in in CES and the version in Agoric SDK for doing transform for other for the evasive transforms, um, and uh, uh, I, I I suspect that it is possible to just use the three components and avoid using core. Uh, I just wasn't able to figure out how. Um, yeah, yeah, it's all, all our all our headaches basically only came from Babel standalone, because um, because as you were saying, Nicolo, uh, that it it's, brings in a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's like the main difference with between Babel Core or Standalone and or the components is that Babel Core and Standalone also support like resolving the config. So if you have like presets, they are resolved down to plugins and there to their and then to their internal transforms. Uh, while with the three components, you would just have to pass a single uh, like visitor, a single transform and do everything there rather than be able to organize with different plugins, but maybe you don't care about it. Um, yeah, yeah. Certainly worth exploring. Yeah. With uh, with our static static module record emulation, we actually do two passes. One, uh, we do an analysis pass and then a transform pass. Um, that should be fine. Is it that that use we we've refactored that to be a more clear separation in in, in recent months. Um. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Well, I, I wish that we had more material to dig into, but at this point, it looks like we, we need to go and do some more homework on. Yep. Uh, um, by the way, uh, to make sure that like it's more likely that just using the two components will make everything work, uh, because I mean, with a lot less code, there is like less possibilities of loading shims. However, uh, I would be happy, uh, like if you want to contribute to our repository, for example, with a request that freezes the test environment to make sure that we do not mutate it, I would be happy to, to review it. I'm also wondering, um, one of the reasons we remove the transforms and uh, things like that is that usually it pulls in um, Regenerator and uh, and other shims, uh, which and I believe the one of the reason we want to avoid those, uh, well, on top of not running transform code, is because uh, they often trigger the override mistake. Uh, and I I suppose maybe that's also something we should try to fix upstream. Or am I mistaken there? Uh, yes, so we do not directly maintain uh, Regenerator or all the CoreJS plugins. 
uh, polyfills. I mean, for polyfills, for polyfills, obviously it's problematic, but for a generator, it could work uh, if needed. Uh, I know that it expects uh, like a non-frozen environment uh, because it attaches itself as a global on the window object. Uh, there are some talks about rewriting it to ESM so that it like exports the, the helper rather than defining it as a global. Uh, but there has been so enough three, an issue about that for years. The three components don't actually pull in any polyfills directly, do they? Uh, they don't. Uh, that's all in separate plugins. Yeah, I think a frozen global is not the default uh, result of a lockdown. Uh, lockdown freezes the intrinsic, it doesn't freeze the, the global. Um, I think I also have more of a curious question, uh, curiosity question. I find a lot of projects that end up pulling in the generator transforms uh, and maybe it's a mistake in their uh, target uh, preset on configuration or I'm not sure, but it, it, it feels like a lot of projects end up pulling in those transforms when they don't really need to. Uh, and, and I'm actually curious how uh, the community or Babel is steering uh, the community towards avoiding doing that. <laughs> yes, so I believe at least in the past, uh, most people were not even aware of the targets option. Uh, so they were just compiling everything to S5 by default. We have made some changes in the last year uh, that make it more like we had some blog post about possible optimizations and we moved the targets option to be used more and to be more visible so uh, people are noticing it more and also in bubble a if we will change the default value of targets to be uh, whatever browsers list define as uh, like not that browsers rather than just everything down to s5 so this will reduce the amount of transforms that are pulled in. That's and awesome. it might break people's code because it will start transforming less, but at least people will, will actually notice the targets option and set what's good for them. But yes, it's, I think it's mostly a communication problem or just that people do not know uh, what targets they would need. So they just transform everything. I think it's a little bit more than that. I know that I hesitated to up, well, I mean, I wrote this module called Q a really long time ago, and I have hesitated to upgrade it at all ever because, <laughs> because, uh, or like to use ESM syntax, for example, because everything that you do like that limits is, is potentially a breaking change. And I found that breaking Q is very dangerous. Um, so like, I think that there is a tendency for library authors like myself to prefer to fix the compilation target at a point in the past, at the, at the inception of the project, really, in order to keep it from having a breaking change. Well, I mean, for libraries, for libraries, it's not, it's not uncommon to just target the uh, latest LTS, not JS version at the point of the last major release. Uh, like there are some libraries that support everything from a node 0.10 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> from what I've seen outside of people involved in discipline nine, uh, most library authors just target the latest LTS version. Yeah, I have definitely worked at companies that were stuck on node version 0, 10, 36, um, more or less forever. <laughs> uh. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the advice. I, I think, uh, yeah, moving everything to the three components would definitely be a, a good starting point. Wait, so most of the, all, my, all of the documentation on Babel is framed in terms of core, right? Um, 
is there is there a a piece of documentation maybe you could help us find a piece of documentation on how to use these components piecewise um that that would be helpful to me i know i know that's probably where i ran out of gas on this yeah okay so we at least have uh, a list of options for build parser and build generator uh, we might not have good documentation for Babel Traverse. However, uh, so when it comes to Babel's internals, I usually suggest to check how we do it internally. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, there is a good document. It's the, called the uh, plugin handbook uh, that yes. defines like all the internal Babel Traverse API. I mean, not all the internal, but the the most important internal API. Uh, I don't think that the like external, like entry point of Google Traverse is actually documented, but most of what you will need is there. Yeah, and, uh, but, and Michael has example code that I can look at too. But yeah, at least for Google Parser and Google Generator, we have documentation on, on our website. Yes. Well, one piece of useful information I've gleaned from this so far is that there's a uh, that in our current use with Babel standalone, there's a great deal of ceremony about um, transforms that are included, um, and that when we migrate to using the three components directly, we can simply forget about all of those things instead of instead of having to pick and choose which ones we want to keep. What I did find was um, prettier had a list of. Um, the parser options that they turn on, plugin, the parser plugin options. And uh, that was, it was like long and comprehensive, but I didn't find anything else where you could just say, turn on all the syntax. And uh, uh, I mean, by default, we enable all the stable syntax. We had in the past an option to enable all the proposals by default, uh, but there are proposals, they're not meant to be stable. So we, we removed that option at some point. So stable syntax will always be enabled by default. If you want to use proposals, you have to choose what you want and what you do not want. Uh, and, but yes, we I have a list stable of- syntax, st Stable syntax plus modules. modules uh, well, and stuff. yes. Uh, there is like a source type option that does, I want to enable modules because you have to choose between source type script and module. And then all the stable syntax is already there. Oh, okay. So maybe that that list of options was unnecessary. That would be useful. Yeah. <laughs> so for Preter, it's mostly for uh, like people use Preter with experimental like with proposals. So they need to enable proposals too. Mm. I sent the docs of the parser in the chat. Thank you. Okay. So it's basically just the source type flag and then the then don't have to specify any plugins to get the latest stable syntax. Yes. Okay, that's that's really useful. Thank you. Ah uh, yeah, I've seen this. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was the only topic for today and I think that we've spent it. <laughs> Um, we have, we have, like, again, we have our homework to do to see if we can make any progress. And then of course, um, and then to recap, we also have, um, uh, your invitation, Nicola, to put together a PR to, um, to, uh, to test Babel, at least the part, at least the, the three internal parts in the context where there are primordial, uh, frozen primordials. Um, I think, I think, yeah. We, we totally know that that works because we're using both Babel standalone and the three components. And the three components only need to be initialized after lockdown and it works okay. Okay. Yeah. So no surprises there. Yeah, I mean, testing that that's in our CI would make sure that it continues working. Yeah, um, I'm, are we, so there, there are layers of support for CES, the, the first, the first layer is, can you use it at all <laughs> in, in, in an environment that's using CES? The, the second layer after that is, can you use, can you initialize it after lockdown has been called? Um, and we're confident that the three, the three internal components of Babel work under those circumstances. 
Um, the third layer is, can you load it in a compartment? <laughs> Which is to say, um, with, with only the shared intrinsics. I, do we know whether we can do that yet? I, I don't think that we can. I'm not, I'm, in any case, we haven't tried. Yeah. Do we expect any particular easy. source of problem? Um, there, it, there would be a problem if the internal components of Babel reached out to globals that do not exist inside of a compartment. Um, so I expect them to only use uh, like features defined within the atmosphere specification and nothing not geo specific or uh, web specific. Uh, yeah. Or web specific. So I. I would expect them to work, like at least those three main components. Uh, yeah. Some other pieces, like Babel Core, are definitely not going to work. Yeah. Uh, but most of the other stuff, like most of the, I don't know, plugins or all the internal packages should work in a compartment. That, that makes sense to me. I mean, there, do compartments have maths at random? Uh, they can be granted math.random okay. through an endowment, but they do not have it by default. Okay, because we might be using that somewhere to generate like not cryptographically secure unique identifiers. Uh, so that might be a problem, but I do not remember if we still use that. Uh, uh, what might you be using it for? And could you be using symbols instead? Uh, probably. Potentially, yes. I don't remember. Like, I remember uh, that we used that in the past. I don't remember how or why right now. I would yeah. have to check. I can, I can, the only reason I can imagine wanting to do that is if symbols are not available or if you, if it's participating. strings, though, I think. Yeah, if you're, if you, if you're, if it's participating in the syntax tree, then it can't be a symbol. Since it needs to round trip through JSON. Ah. Yeah, we're the um, obviously we can we could provide a math a, a math dot random that's driven by a reproducible pseudo random generator or just a counter. Probably a counter is the cleanest thing, but um, uh, just in general, uh, we're very allergic to sources of non determinism, uh, okay, which is so why I, I just checked and we're only using that in Bible core to have a symbol like thing that can be run tripped through JSON, uh, but it's Perfect. only Babel core. So for their packages, there shouldn't be a problem. Brilliant. Yeah, that's, that, that's about what we would expect. Yeah, cool. So, so the internals are pure, essentially, and don't reach out to any powers through the module system or the globals. That, that yeah, makes so sense. It's possible that you might find a problem in like some of our dependencies. Uh, we like we check which dependencies we pull in, but we never like worried about whether they were fully pure or not. Yeah. Are you uh, open so... to taking CES as a dev dependency for the purposes of an integration test? Uh, yes. Well, amazing. Um, and we'll, we'll see how long that lasts too, because I imagine that the, the, <laughs> the first time you see an opaque error come out because the CES integration test has a, would be, is, is really the question. <laughs> what what, <laughs> what so happens? Even if, even if we could isolate it as a sub package and just do some basic sanity checks that wouldn't have to be taken on as the rest of the, the dependencies would. Oh yeah, indeed. It'd still be fine. All right, cool. Um, yeah, thank you again, Nicolo, for having this conversation with us. Okay. It's very helpful. No, I'm happy to chat about this. Yeah, it sounds like this particular concern is winding down, but as long as we have you here, uh, would this be a, um, would it be productive to talk about the Babel support for line and column number preservation and the bugs that we've been encountering with that? Oh, indeed. Yeah, so um, I, I made a small hack. <clears throat> there in the Babel generator is your catch up function that allows it to, this, to, to advance the line number until it's the actual line number of the next token. Um, 
I, I extended that to also advance the column number if necessary. But uh, because Babel Generator has some opinion on formatting, um, like we've seen recast in the past to uh, kind of provide, produce source code round tripping if there's no modifications to it. Um, but they don't support the the preserve, um, re retain lines option. So uh, we tried hacking it up to make it work better, but it's, there's just several places where they don't use it, and it's unfortunate. Okay. I, yes, this is because source maps are not an option for you? It, yes. Not so much that they're not an option as, as if it's a transform that is difficult to audit. And that's that's exactly what the problem is. Even if we had source maps, that would not that would yeah. make the auditing, auditing story any easier. Basically. Yeah, we want we want the the program that's running uh, to be as close as possible to the the code that the programmer is thinking about, the code the programmer wrote, the code that the programmer is seeing in their debugger. Um, and every time we've admitted a any kind of unobvious transformation, uh, it's always introduced uh, hazards because of the difference in the actual semantics versus what the code looks like it's doing. The, um, the standards of semantics preserving that most transformations engage in uh, is not semantics preserving for us. So that's, that's one reason why we're avoiding source maps in general, uh, because we're avoiding uh, any kind of tr you know, transforms like that in general. The particular transform we're doing, uh, we very, very carefully designed to be minimally intrusive. So there's large sections of the code, basically everything without an import or an export, uh, we ideally should be completely preserved um, uh, exactly as it originally appeared in the source and only the lines with import or export um, to a good first approximation uh, should be modified in the transform that we're doing. Um, and uh, the other reason that we're um, avoiding source maps is just support for source maps is spotty uh, and support for source URL is much less spotty. Um, so, uh, if we can minimize the source differences uh, semantically because we don't want to transform, then minimizing them textually as well allows us to just avoid source maps. Yeah, in, there, in particular, the problem with source maps is that uh, it doesn't work through eval, right? Yeah, not without a, uh, an intrusive shim, it doesn't work everywhere anyway. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I want to say we may have an opportunity for somebody to work on a bounty to kind of import, to bring some features of recast to Babel, if that would be appreciated. Um, I think the main thing is using the tokens property of the AST uh, to be able to emit the same uh, locations for things like curly braces and stuff like that, to just walk through that tokens list while we're emitting, while we're generating code. Um, it wouldn't be as featureful as recast is because recast also tries to do its best to, to format stuff that isn't in the tree. But I think it would be a lot more predictable and easy to understand. Um, have you ever thought of upstreaming something like that? Or has it come up? Uh, no, mostly because when I made this, I like recast is good enough for me. Uh, like I use recast as a Babel plugin. Uh, so this is something that I would first need to talk about uh, with the rest of the team, of the Babel team. Uh, if the changes to implement this token-based printing are very big, it might make sense to like do it as a separate generator package uh, because like the generator is pluggable in Babel in a way. So, we could have like two generators, one which is the current one and one which is the recast-like one. Uh, but I, this depends on how much code would be shared between the two packages and how much would be custom, like different. Uh, 
regarding right hand columns, I also do not have an opinion right now, like an, an alternative option, which is to like with like written lines. I think someone already asked us for something like that in the past, uh, like a few years ago, uh, but we never really considered the like the property feature request. Uh, but I, I, I do not really have an opinion on this. I should ask to the rest of the team. Sure. Yeah. The retain columns is like eight, eight lines of code. It's all it really is. So. Okay. So. Uh, I'm checking if we already have an open issue about that. Uh, I guess you could open an issue on the PR uh, and we can discuss that uh, like easily on GitHub uh, so that everyone who might be interested gets notified. Okay. Yeah, um, I can open up the two issues and maybe, or maybe Chris you can help with that too as far as the the only yeah the only difference that i would see is that if um if there's a way to adapt the the generator uh where it actually puts things into the buffer to compare that against where we think we are in the token list so far and that would that would be a very cheap way of getting recast like behavior without having to worry too much about the apps the ast or anything like that just be the token list that we'd be looking at. Okay, so yeah, that sounds doable. Uh, well, we'll like, I would need to see, I'm not really like expert in the generator code. So I uh, like, I know on a high level how the buffer, internal buffer works and how it decides right. where to print things, but I, I do not have the necessary knowledge to understand of this right now. Michael, for, for the solution you have in mind, uh, how close would it come to the ideal of the unmodified lines appear exactly as they appeared in the original sources? So um, it would come very, very close, uh, if not perfect. So basically the behavior we'd like is for the original source to be printed and where we've done a transform to either omit some, omit some tokens with spaces or else uh, insert uh, new things at the end of the line that are written out concisely. They don't have to be formatted in any way. So uh, so basically, it would pr preserve all the front parts of the line as much as they could. And uh, the way the Babel um, token list works is it has all the tokens that were parsed in order with source line and source column attached to them. So we have all the information that's necessary. It's just a matter of putting it together in the generator, I think. This sounds great. And, um, which is why Recast does, but Recast does a lot of other things too, which make it difficult for us to use. <laughs> so. Yeah, by the way, we recently made some changes to how we mark uh, location in the parser. Uh, so you might want to, I mean, I think that there were only additive changes. So the your current approach might still work, uh, but you might want to to check if it still works with the latest parser version. Yeah, I, I have seen that. So the 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 column number advancing works fine. Yeah, that's still that's still okay. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we can continue this discussion uh, on GitHub so that everyone else think can can see that. Yeah, and what is the best way to, um, well, are you open to being reached over chat? <laughs> I suppose is the uh, Yes, I guess. So you can contact me on Matrix. I'm in the, like in the T39 channels. Of course. Mm -hmm. Or if you want, we have a Babel Slack channel. Uh, you can look at any Babel issue and the bot posts that are the, the Slack invite. Ah, I see. Uh, if you prefer, I'm, I'm available on Matrix. Uh, yeah. I think I have two accounts on Matrix. One is the like at matrix.org one, and the other one is uh, like at agalia.com. Uh, contact me at the at the Matrix one, or I mean on Twitter, whatever you want. 
Yeah, obviously, yeah. Twitter was the easiest place I could find, <laughs> but it's also the loudest. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. We we do have an Agoric chat uh, or Agoric Slack, so some of us are already using it, but that might be the easiest way to get in touch with you folks. Just so we're not uh, singling you out for the person uh, to get support from. I, yeah, indeed. <laughs> I think we can set up a shared Slack channel. Oh, that'd be great. If yeah. Needed. Like we have some of them, uh, like with Webpack or Next. So, like for the purpose of this, we could set up that Slack channel. I, I expect that this will be a light enough conversation that we won't have to, to do that. But, um, but but of course happy to um okay i mean if it will be needed like let's start yeah. by opening the issues and then if it will yeah. be needed we can yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Discuss okay so this has been great thank you very much this is a uh well we'll, we'll find you when we get stuck <laughs> okay well. all right um i think that that, that I'll, I'll conclude the recording at that um, but once again, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.